Where do old aeroplanes go when the time comes to retire them from the sky? Almost one in ten of them are flown to eCube Solutions in Wales, one of the world's fastest growing facilities for the recycling and stripping out of old aircraft. Whatever the customer wants, we'll take off. Every year, around 60 commercial airliners land at the company's designated airbase, and the lads just can't wait to get their hands on them. All these planes, and you just get to play with the biggest toy set in the world. This squadron of high-vis heroes love to get their hands dirty and fly in the face of whatever problems are thrown at them. Yeah, there's pressure. Um, we cope with it. We thrive on it. They join forces to take these old airliners to pieces so their thousands of mechanical components can be sold on to satisfy the growing global demand for refurbished plane parts. Let's get them off the aircraft. But it's a race against the clock to take these multi-million pound planes to pieces before they reach their final destination, the scrapyard. All these are ready to go now, so we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in, and they're going to start smashing them up. Join the lads as they battle hostile weather and get to grips with massive machinery. I see them go down smoother, put it that way. All to meet deadlines set by bullish buyers. Money's time, time's money. And we're not talking peanuts here, we're talking millions. Welcome to the world of the plane reclaimers. So, good job, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> Devouring and destruction of aircraft has begun with shattering urgency here at E-Cube this morning. As today of all days, there's no time to hang about. Yeah, we've uh, we've just got a slot available now for uh, an Airbus, so we're uh, going to fit that in and uh, try and get it cut and finished in uh, in record time. Chicken's Yard is the final resting place of many a commercial aircraft that's reached the end of its working life. Right now, his monster-sized machines are finishing off the remains of their latest prey, an Airbus A340 that just a few short weeks ago flew in from France, where she'd been used to ferry folk throughout the world. Her new owners believe this old aircraft is of more value to them as a parts plane, and they've had all of her valuable components stripped out and sold on. All that's left now is a scrap job, and these powerful mechanical jaws won't be stopped in tearing chunks of fuselage and aeroplane wing limb from limb. Yeah, as, uh, as far as demolitions go, that, that aircraft didn't last very long. That was one of the fastest we've had, uh, so um, on to the next one. Chicken's wrecking crew are setting a cracking pace, and if anything's certain about this airbase, it's that work here is going to stay this relentless. And there's a good reason why, as the take-out and tear-down boys will be under more pressure than usual to finish their latest job. Another Airbus has just flown in from France, this time the slightly more petite Airbus A319, which made its final flight after 22 years in service and touched down on the tarmac here in Cardiff, ready to be stripped and scrapped at speed. The A319 is a two-engined narrow-body airliner that's capable of flying 3,700 nautical miles in one go. Without doubt, the lads are prepared to go the distance. And they've already been handed their orders for the day. Focusing on the bottom line. This is today's plan of action, yeah? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Did you get that? As long as we're down the pub by half three, all is well. Sam will certainly deserve a drink when this job's through. OK, let's go. As the work will be far from easy peasy, the pressure is being piled on to deliver this one. The aircraft's new owner has drawn up a harvest list of 1,200 items that need salvaging from the A319, and they're demanding that each one be stripped and shipped ASAP. They have different approaches to how they tell us what they would like off the aircraft. Some would just say, just go through the aircraft, strip those components out of the systems, and then just deliver them to us as a full set once you're finished. Others will give us a, a precise harvest list with a whole set of exact part numbers 
of uh, the description of parts that they want off. And it makes it an awful lot more difficult for our team because they've got to run around the aircraft trying to find these part numbers, which may or may not be on there. And in certain cases, they may have to go back to the manuals, to the illustrated parts catalogue, and actually see if they can find where that item is located. And in a sense, it's a little bit like doing a jigsaw backwards. Yo, dudes. The first puzzle piece to be struck off the harvest list will be the A319's two most important and valuable components, its turbofan engines. It's like folding fitted sheets at home with the missus. I hate doing it. Under the direct supervision of the airline's authorised technicians, Sam and his right-hand man, Khalil, can get on with their mucky mission. I got it. You can, you can do the next one. Never clean, eh? Yeah? Initially, you think, oh, Sam's a tough guy, like, you don't want to be on the wrong side of him. And then when you get to know him, then you know he's, he's just a joker, just like the rest of us. He messes around, um, he has a bit of a laugh. And it's just, it's good to know that, like, you can be serious and he can mess around and um, have a bit of a joke when the time comes. We're just draining the fuel at the lines and we'll empty the oil tank as well. Uh, it's got to be done because yeah, the engine's getting transported, the air cargo, so it can't have any fuel and oil in it. So that's basically what we do. It's easier to do it, to drain it while it's hanging on the wing than in the engine stand. It's quite, quite, um, quite awkward to get into on the engine stand to get the drip trays in to drain it into. Oh, OK. Didn't expect that. At least I caught the plug. That was quite a bit. A bit more than I expected. You're lucky you weren't lying down there, Sam. Did you get him making a mess, did you? You would have had a face full of oil and the fuel. Yeah. Can be a bit nervy, you know, so it's worth a lot of money, the engines. So you'd have to be careful what you're doing, you know, with your tools and that, make sure you don't damage it. As I say, big, big books. There's more than I'll ever see in my lifetime hanging there on that wing. <laughs> big bucks, you're telling me. With turbofan engines like this worth up to $5 million a piece, they can't afford to be languishing idle in a hangar. There is huge demand from other airlines and enterprising middlemen around the world to buy up these valuable components in order to refurbish and sell them on, making a tidy profit in the process. So it's no surprise that the new owner wants these engines removed serviceably, meaning they're needed to go straight back out to work to power another plane up into the sky and start earning their keep. Today, Sam and Khalil will need to graft alongside a couple of incomers. Unlike any of the workforce here at E-Cube, Luis and Freddy hold special B-1 credentials to allow them to remove these engines serviceably. They're being paid by an American airline and they've flown more than 4,000 miles to take on this sole job. We travel from, from Miami all around the world. Yeah, yeah, here it's, uh, it's different because over there it's like 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and here is cold, rain, rainy, all oh, snows, and I'm used to, day. yeah, I'm putting in layers and layers of clothes. Will you change Miami for a car then? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as well as there's no time for sightseeing now, there are deadlines to meet, and the men from Miami must work quickly and seamlessly with our chaps from Cardiff. I'm just gonna tilt it to you now, get it away from the forks. We never know sometimes what, what nationalities we're going to be working with. We've had um, a lot of Americans, Irish, uh, Spanish, we've had them from South America. I think Venezuela was one of the last lot to come in. I mean, even in this country, the accents can be tricky to understand. I mean, you've got, uh, <coughs> you got Timo with his northern accent sometimes. You know, what? <laughs> you know? And some of the Welsh boys, they can, when they start talking amongst themselves, yeah, you can make it difficult, but we get there. I don't have to leave it for you to do, but he ignored uh, me. We need to work in sign language then if it gets that bad. <laughs> Luckily, the lads have rubbed shoulders a few times before, but there's no time for small talk now. 
time, as they say, is money, and the two valuable turbofan engines need to come off pronto. So now we're bringing the load off the engine with a booster. Right the engine weighs in at just under 2.4 tons. Although it's a move that the lads have done countless times before, it's always nail-biting stuff. It's uh, always, you know, you're sweating, you're, you feel pump, you know? <laughs> To add to the weighty pressure the lads are now feeling, the final bolt is taking a fair bit of persuading. Normally, we get the stands on quite simply. They, they, they fall in normally. But we're having issues with the pins, the, the actual um, the lug itself, trying to get them in place. Well, it seems to, as you can hear, it's just about there. <laughs> the liberal use of American muscle has granted this engine its freedom. But the next task will be just as demanding. The lads need to gently manoeuvre this monster mass clear of the pylon the engine was attached to. All right, quarter in the back. OK, everybody ready? Ready. Ready. Quarter of the turn. Quarter. All right. It's looking good. Good, yeah. All right, let's just check now for any anything tied to the engine. All right. All right, quarter in the front. Ready, quarter. Ready, quarter. Ready, quarter. The job is not only time sensitive, any slight dink, dent, or damage could mean disastrous consequences when the engine fires up again to power a fully loaded passenger plane 160 right. knots down a runway. You got to think about hundreds of lives that are in there, you know, in the air that are flying with that. Uh, and you're making sure that everybody's safe, you know, that's the most important thing. Good. All right, down. Down. Hold on, what was that? It was, uh, oh, she's pushing that. Yeah. Yeah. Get the weights off these chains, shall we? It's tense stuff. Get the weights off. That's fine. That's fine? Yeah, we've got a good inch and a half, two inches now. Okay. As soon as the weight come off, the wing went up. It sort of, it opened up. The engine is now free. Right, so we can, yeah, everything went perfect. We just came down. We're separated from the pilot already. So we're just going to pull the engine out. So we're down and safe. Mission accomplished. The Americans have completed their sortie. Now, the men from Miami can finally get a bit of R&R &R before flying back home. So, are you happy with them to go work in my day for the time being? Yeah, go on. Not all the odd accents heard in the hangar will be leaving with them. With so many regional dialects in the UK, it seems that even fellow Brits often find it difficult to understand what's being said here. I didn't get the tube, did I? We were... It's nice to have a little bit of banter, even though he can't understand what he says all the time. Oh, there we go. You all know very well that I am not a brummie. Not from where? I am not a brummie. Not a brummie? And it's all been explained before. <laughs> it's time to finally get to the bottom of where Sam really hails from. Certainly Sam is from uh, Birmingham. But you know what he calls me? Northern Monkey. And uh, he's called me that since I came here. So for... Sam, or commonly known as Yam Yam, he... Uh... He mumbles a little bit. But I'd just like to say I'm getting barracked at the moment from a bunch of gentlemen stood outside the door. Something to say, Mr. Seymour? <laughs> See what I mean? You can't understand a word he says, can you? <laughs> he's, he's typical, Brummy. He's very gruff. Um, and he talks like he wants to shout all the time. <laughs> So you'll find people go around the hangar, Sam will be shouting, no one'll understand the word he says, and all you'll hear from Sam is, oh, so do my, so do my, so do my, mate, mate, fuck a mate, mate. And we all just laugh at him and we all do it back to him, and he hates it. First off, I'm not from Birmingham. I'm not from the Midlands. I'm from a town called Stamford in uh, South Lincolnshire. It's a good 100 miles from Birmingham, or anybody that speaks like that. <laughs> There's a lot of me ducks and all that where I am. <laughs> no, still didn't understand a single word of what he just said then. What was that? Our high-vis heroes have been ploughing on with their harvest list. 
Now that the engines are off, the lads have come out in force. And for team leader Sam, that just means more people to wind up. Chopped your nuts. Let me do that at your age, mate. <laughs> now that Dave's been insulted, it's time for Sam to turn his attention to Timo, who, as far as he's concerned, could have been put out to pasture a long time ago. So in our care and community scene, we've been letting these uh, power tools and that. It takes them back to their youth a bit, it does. But back in, in Timo's day, they'd have been steam-driven tools they'd have used. Now he's pretending he can't. He's obviously not turned his hearing aid on this morning. <laughs> Sam may be taking the mickey, but I keep my eye on your power tools, Timo. I think he's taking a bit of a fancy to them. Sam's only jealous because he'll need some top tools for his next task, removing the cockpit's front windows. Worth up to a staggering $8,000 a pop. I should really put my glasses on when I do stuff like this. It might make it a lot easier to see what I'm doing. There we go. With the job prepped inside, Sam can move outside to remove the bolts holding the window plates in place. But first, he needs to get harnessed up to safely take the scissor ladder 16 feet up to the nose of the cockpit. Worst thing is when you pick one up and it's been worn by them in somebody really tiny. With short legs and short bodies and that, it's a nightmare. You've got to adjust it all up and that. Sam might be fussy about whose safety gear he borrows, but when it comes to power tools, he's managed to acquire one that he had his eye on a few minutes ago. The drill i got here, this is uh, Timo's. It's a heavy old bit of kit. I don't know how, at his age, he can wield one of these about. There's a fair bit of weight in it. It's made my arm ache now. I think everybody is proud of their tool kit for however big or small it is, because uh, it's a bit like, a, I guess, a woman's handbag. It's very personal, it's very private, and you do get very uh, covetous of your, of your tools. And sometimes they're with you for 20 or 30 years. So tools are important. Turn all the bolts out on the top plate, and all the bolts are out on the bottom plate now. Get that plate off, and then we're good to go. Uh, get the windows out then. Each of the cockpit's front windows are very heavy, but Sam has just the bit of kit to help steal it out. This is Cat Burglar's kit. <laughs> suction cup, yeah, vacuum suction cup. So just, uh, it's like an extra hand to hold flat on. It uh, sucks onto the window, causes a vacuum, and uh, it's pretty, pretty solid, really, pretty good. Gently does it now. All right, mate, it's all yours now. There we go. Two windscreens off. With no dramas. No cracks. With the average Airbus A319 clocking up around 22 years of service before retirement, it's safe to say their parts were built to last. And there's still a lot of life left in them yet as these valuable components will be recycled into another passenger plane. But not all reclaimed aircraft parts are destined for a second life back up in the skies. On an unremarkable industrial estate in Manchester, there's a man who works as part of a team who train those who fly for a living to prepare for any eventuality. Meet Michael Shunker. So what we've got here is the salvage Airbus A320 aircraft that was provided to us by EQ. Michael works for EDM, a company that transforms salvaged plane parts into training simulators, which all the major airlines use to prepare their cabin crew for life in the sky. So interiors have been stripped out and we're now preparing this cabin for the training simulation equipment to be installed. This fuselage is clearly a work in progress, but here's one they made earlier. And believe me when I tell you, there are some very unexpected surprises in store. The cabin crew will learn 
by using this, these galleys how to actually service people on the aircraft, so how to operate a microwave, how to check that uh, things are turned on properly, turned off properly. OK, so far so good. And also how to operate things like the tray, the, uh, the, the galley tables and work surfaces. So this is, this is really all about uh, cabin service training in here. This high-tech simulator is jam-packed with a range of devices that have been created to help prepare airline crew for any eventuality. Since our tear-out boys in Wales handed over this fuselage, it's been completely recrafted with an array of special effects and computer wizardry added. OK, we're going to run the decompression simulation now. And that's not all it does. Some of the key parts of the, the training is smoke and fire in various compartments throughout the aircraft cabin. When you're sat with the doors closed, it's really, really easy to forget that you're actually not on a real aircraft and that you are just sat in a steel tube in Manchester. We can control the weather. What we're going to do now is simulate a left-hand engine fire. Josh, we've got fire outside the window over the wing area, and then we can transition that into a full fire outside the entire left-hand side of the aircraft now. And just when you thought things couldn't get any worse. Clearly this would be really terrifying if you were sat on a real aircraft now experiencing this. What we try and do is, is demonstrate a kind of worst case scenario so that the cabin crew react in a way that they've trained to do when they hear passenger panic, for example. Josh, we can launch that. Thanks, Josh. One of the other sounds that we can simulate is the evac sound. So obviously that sounds really important for the cabin crew and what they need to do. Under Josh's guidance, it's time to land this flight from hell. Aircraft just touched down. OK. It's a superb emergency landing, but there goes the undercarriage. Perhaps you can salvage another one from E-Cube. There are thousands of valuable parts and reusable components that are stripped off the aeroplanes that come through this hangar, and Sam has had a hand in removing many of them. But today, there's one sizable section needed for the harvest list that many of the fellas here have never had the chance to get their mitts on. How's that? OK, so this morning we're going to be removing the four Fussy Versa cows. Right there where the engines go. Um, they're big old bits of kit, weigh about, um, about a third of a tonne each. It's quite a, an intensive job, really, it's just, um, especially with the lads not, not, not having done one before. The, the two lads with us here haven't done them before, so uh, they're going to rely on me a lot to uh, show them the way on this one. And with Sam keeping a watchful eye over the lads, they're sure to be in safe hands. Right, this is going to swing to me. We've well, got to be careful. Don't, don't be leaning on it too much, don't we? Because if they drop a little bit, you end up crapping yourself, yeah? All right. You don't need noises like that when you're doing it either. There you go. Well, that's clear, isn't it? All clear? You've been catching? All good? the reverse thruster won't be scrapped. After being sold on and shipped off to a new home, they'll be checked over and serviced before being put to work on another aircraft. And it turns out that they're pretty useful when landing a plane. They shut off the air going through the engine and force it back forward. So it's acting like a braking system for the aircraft. When you go flying, like, you feel all the vibration when you land. A lot of that is from the thrustiverse has been activated. Now clear of the aircraft, the reverse thruster is tilted round to sit like a tortoise shell on the edge of specially made stands. These bespoke parts have been carefully crafted by veteran carpenter Ed to keep this valuable cargo safe in transit. Used to do this and find it quite awkward to get them level, but all the strops, everything now has been mastered really. As you see, we'll probably do it in maybe three or four hours. 
time is money, isn't it? So. Uh... <laughs> But it seems that Ed's handiwork isn't helping to beat the clock today. Every time. Can't get over while it's still too small. It's a burr on the old. So when he's drilled them out, he hasn't deburred them. So you just like, we've got to just file them out a little bit so the bolt will go all the way through. If there's one thing that really screws up Sam's day, it's bird threads. And as a man that's always ready for a bit of a wind-up, he's plotting a bit of payback. What you, need, what you need to do, right, is you need to get some, some thick old grease and get it on the trigger of his gun. Right, that'll, set him off, that'll set him off good and proper, yeah? You'll blame me anyway, even if you do it. And even if he sees you do it, I'll still get the blame. Wait till he's not looking, man. But there's no fooling a man of Ed's experience. I know all the tricks, boy, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked him for a nice clean rag so I can wipe my hands, and he's given me a dirty, oily one to wipe my hands in. Oh, yeah, he hates, he hates oil and grease, Ed does. So we always, uh, always try and get a little bit of grease on the trigger of his gun while he's working. He knows it's going to happen, though, most of the time. <laughs> a lot of the times we do... Um, we have a bit of a fun, we have a bit of a laugh, but we never, ever um, stop the job just to go and mess around somewhere else. And so we do get the job done, and the management is happy with us just getting on with it. Every dog gets his day, that's what they say. Yeah, Ed may be waiting a while to find the time to get his own back, as he's a very busy man. Many of the valuable components being salvaged can be shipped anywhere in the world, and the carpentry team do a vital job in making sure both the massive machines and petite parts can arrive safely in bespoke wooden crates. We have nine carpenters working full-time, and sometimes we work on a shift pattern, so they're working around the clock. They're making about 200 of these wooden crates per month. But when you look at the complexity of some of them, we have some examples of the engine thrust reversers uh, right next to us. Um, these are not simple crates. And, and we also fabricate metal stanchions for some of the components to sit on uh, to ensure that when this component gets shipped anywhere in the world, it does not move at all. There is no risk of it being damaged. A thrust reverser like this must be worth a quarter of a million dollars. It has to arrive in absolutely perfect condition. Most of the items that come off the aircraft are, are very, very fragile. You, you have to treat them like you treat your own little baby. So you have to make sure they're wrapped up in cotton wool, make sure they're all safe, and get them to the customer without being damaged. The lads are certainly treating the side cockpit yep. windows with kid gloves. They're carefully cushioning their weight with layered bags of hot foam. As the foam cools, it moulds itself around the window frames to create their own protective armour which is quite handy, really, as it sounds like Phil is expecting them to come under mortar fire. Incoming. 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 Yeah, Phil, Phil's favourite word seems to be incoming. You know, I mean, he does work with a lot of hot material, so... And he has been in the forces for a long time. When you're as old as Phil, then uh, it's a bit of a hard habit to get out of, I suppose. Incoming. Like many of the lads here, Phil cut his teeth in the military. And it sounds like his 30 years in the forces really taught him how to stay cool under fire when the action really hots up. As you use the machine more, the, the, the temperature of the, the, the foam goes up. The handling of it is like a hot potato. You've got to, be, you've got to spread it through the bag quickly and handle it, uh, get it into the boxes quickly because uh, it becomes a bit too hot to handle. Like a lot of the guys here, you know, they're a bit too hot to handle. <laughs> I just don't know who you're talking about, Phil. With the engines now both removed from the A319, it's time to get them parceled up and swiftly shipped out to their expectant new owner. But if you're splashing a lot of cash on big, shiny, new-to-you turbofan engines, you're going to expect them to come gift-wrapped, as Kyle knows only too well. It's a long process that you go through, literally heat shrink it, prep it, and then it's down for transportation then. With lots of intricate moving parts to protect, 
Kyle's making sure there's no chance this multi-million dollar engine will be damaged in transit before reaching its new home. Just to making sure everything's secure on you, like this, this little bit of foam. What we'll do is we'll send a big bit of black wrap through the front of the blade. So basically, it'll only have a little bit of movement in it instead of it going full the way around. We desiccant underneath the bottom of the engine. You'll see the desiccant in your trainers when you buy a new pair of trainers. You'll see the little bag. We just got the bigger bags, I say. We've just cut the tough, the tough coat now. So normally we'll put five metres extra tough coat, pull it out, cut it. And then you'll see us take a little run and it'll literally catch a bit of air and then it'll just go, hopefully go flying over the top in one go. Hopefully. Time for that big sheet of gift wrap, an industrial strength polythene plastic. Hold it tight. Ready? Three, two, one. Kyle's only done this a few times before and he's got a lot to live up to. Today, he's under the watchful eye of Phil Gilbert, the man who's turned packing into a bit of an art form. That's, that's a bit open. Hi. Bit of struggle here, mate. I don't know what we're going to do is we'll put, tack it in and take that. Yeah, Kyle, um, he's probably, in, probably on his eighth or ninth engine now. Um, it's, a, it's a slow process and it's something that needs a lot of care. Having served in the Royal Welsh, it's no surprise that Phil takes a regimented approach to packing. I'm known throughout EQ for my, some people call it OCD. Um, I call it attention to detail, uh, but making sure that, you know, that things are straight, um, lines uh, are clear, and everything's kept neat and tidy. The client is, is paying for a service, and you want to try and give them the best service you can, and these little things matter, well, certainly to me. It's hard, it's hard because Phil's like OCD with his, so it's kind of hard to match what Phil does because Phil's pretty good at it. Kyle needs to seal all the holes and gaps before shrink wrapping the plastic. And to do that, he's turning up the heat. It's just literally a gas and a heat gun, so the gas tank and then it leads to the gun. And then literally, <laughs> literally just starts sticking it down. <laughs> Got to wear these big, massive gloves just to keep on, so we can just basically tack down and obviously protect your hands from burning them. Yeah. But it seems it's not just his hands that Kyle needs to worry about. Just singe my face, then. Kyle's really starting to feel hot under the collar now, and for good reason. To measure up to Phil's exacting standards, he needs to try to avoid melting any of the protective plastic sheeting. Tolerance levels of the, the tough coat, once it's in, in its naked form now, it, it, it's, it's tough, it's, it's quite uh, rugged plastic. Um, once you put the heat to it, it becomes very, uh, very flimsy and, and very um, easily uh, broken. The, the slightest pinprick in, in the thing can open up a hole the size of your hand. It'll rip quite quick. Done it straight away. A little tiny hole. It's not the start Kyle was hoping for. But will he be able to up his game to meet Phil's exacting standards? We'll find out later. Should we got all already? The lads of E-Cube have been hard at it. They've been tasked with stripping more than 1,200 items from an Airbus A319 that landed earlier from France. Every time something is removed from the plane, it's either under direct supervision of an authorised company, or the E-Cube lads are following strict protocols dictated by the company responsible for manufacturing and refurbishing the component. They are now nearing the finish line. One of the final items to be crossed off the harvest list is to be stripped from the fuselage now by new boy Marcus. Yeah, I'm picking off this uh, hydraulic uh, motor pump. Basically, I just got to free all the pipes around it, break them off, run all the fluid out. This is the last item on the priority list at the moment. Since starting here at EQ, Marcus has really got his hands dirty. Uh, this is my second week. 
It's nice, it's good variety. Till one second you see a big lump being cut off and then the next minute you're in a tight space like this, taking out little bits. I worked in aviation for a few years, but uh, I had a little bit of a break, and uh, I, this job came out of nowhere, so uh, I saw grabbing it with both hands at the moment. I'm enjoying it, but um, I think uh, further down the line, maybe I'd look to move on. I want to go into water sports uh, uh, eventually. Now, I'm not one to judge, but I'm pretty sure that all the amber liquid now leaking out of that pump isn't what Marcus had in mind when he mentioned water sports. And before you ask, that fluid is actually used to drive the hydraulics around the undercarriage of this Airbus A319. Basically, this uh, hydraulic fluid coming out of this is used for commercial airlines. Uh, Non-compressible, non-flammable. Uh, so really good stuff, but uh, it smells terrible. And it's really bad for your skin. I don't want to get any light. I used to want to get it on your skin, nothing ideally. Even on your clothes. Well, these boots were brand new last week, and they've taken away uh, the first layer or two. <laughs> so it's quite offensive stuff. The cramped conditions aren't helping Marcus to stay clean. There's an awkward fixing holding the hydraulic pump in place, and it's not coming off without a fight. Some of them are quite fiddly, especially at the back of this. There was all wire locking on them as well, so I had to try and cut, cut blind. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't be surprised a lot of hydraulic fluid will fall out of it, but it takes as long as it does. Hopefully, I won't get a lot of hydraulic fluid all over me. <laughs> I wouldn't speak too soon, Marcus. Oh, dirty. <laughs> Every time I do anything, this starts dripping on my face. It's a bit of a pain at the moment. There's no playing ball. <laughs> Got the wire locking off it. I was trying to attack them, but I don't know what the different sizes the round one. Yeah, usually I'll just get on you. Yeah, that's what it seems like at the moment. Just getting access to it. I might have to get rid of all these. I'd take the back ones off first. The nut just won't budge, so Marcus has had to call in for reinforcements. Yeah, yeah, I've just loosened the front ones a little bit. I haven't taken any off. All right. I got him, I got him. Careful, but then I was slipping. With the job now done, it seems Marcus can't wait to wash the day away. Can I sky draw out my mouth? <laughs> oh. <laughs> now I have to go and wash my mouth out, huh? <laughs> well, you did say you liked water sports. Let's just hope that the rest of the teardown boys can stay squeaky clean. The lads have done it. The backwards jigsaw that was the harvest list is now complete. But all the puzzle pieces still need to be boxed. And with their expectant new owner demanding they get shipped out as soon as possible, Kyle's on the job packing and shrink wrapping one of the engines. But to make the grade with his boss, Phil, he needs to get this job all wrapped up as tight as a drum. Once it's cooled down and you tap it, it's like a drum. So if you were to tap that one over there, it's like a drum bang. So it's that tight now. So it should be, it should be as tight as that. But um, that's Phil's, and he's a bit OCD, and he takes, takes pride in everything he does. I'm not like I don't take pride in it, but, you know, like Phil's to the point where he's that OCD, he cleans it. Have a look at it, it's clean. You're cleaning with a rack of, like, like, fairy liquid and that. Absolute nutcase. To be as immaculately turned out as Phil, Kyle sure needs to scrub up a bit. Hopefully we don't blow a big hole. That's my aim of the day. No, no pressure. So far, so good. It looks like Kyle's getting the hang of this. Or maybe not. Eh? No. It's blew the biggest hole I've ever seen in my life here. Yeah. Uh, my God, what the actual... 
That's torn it. Just don't want to blow all in there. It's just like... It's like doing your own work and then just... You're messing it up with the wall in there, do you know what I mean? But it's got... That's the only thing that's disheartening about it, is because Phil does it and don't blow holes in it. It's an absolute joke. With Phil now due back any second, there's just enough time to mask over his mistakes. It doesn't actually matter that um, you blow holes in it because you're going to have to cover it up with the engine tape, but you don't want to blow holes in it just out of pride, basically, because you don't want techies will come in here and say, oh, look at how many holes you've got in that, or Phil will come up to you and say, Jesus, mate, how much tape do you use on that? It's £50 a roll. But it's, it comes part and parcel with the job and with wrapping engines. And if anyone wants to have a say to me about wrapping engines, I'll say to them, go wrap it yourself. With his pride at stake, is Kyle ready for Phil's honest appraisal? Oh, so you come to mark my work now, have you? Yeah, yeah, critique it, mate. What's that, critique it? Yeah, yeah. No, don't. Stop it now. <laughs> this is the one we did, it was. I'd come over here now, we've done three, seven. <laughs> we've done, <laughs> we done this one, we did. Nice try, Carl. But when it's that pristine, it's obviously the engine Phil wrapped earlier. Yeah, that's an excellent job. I don't know who did that one, though, because that's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> It is an art. Uh, I've done 30 or 40 engines, and, you know, it, I, I'd struggle to not actually get um, holes. I mean, that one, that was, that's pretty good, but you're going to get holes um, if you get a, a, a even a cable tie sticking through will pop it and open up the, the plastic. So how does Kyle's work measure up? The engine is sealed, the engine is protected. Uh, he's achieved his goal. It may not be pretty to look at. It may at. not look like that one. It may not be pretty <laughs> to look at, but, you know, not all of us can be pretty, eh? No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's fine. Couldn't have done it by himself. <laughs> <laughs> now that his engine wrapper's passed with flying colours, it's time for Kyle to get it loaded onto the back of a wagon and shift it out. Literally just about to load these engines onto the truck. So we got John on there. Literally going to pick them up, put them on. Once they're on, we've got to wait for some paperwork. They can't leave here until we got a T1 document, which is a customs document, which they got to have with them. So I think that's only because it's going to America. Like, if it was staying anywhere in the UK, it wouldn't have that process. But we've had drivers waiting here, you know, overnight just for the T1 to come through, so... In total, it's taken just a few days to strip these turbofan engines from the Airbus A319 and get them neatly packaged up, ready to be sent to their expectant new owner who will check them thoroughly before sending them back out into service. Now it seems all that's missing is some ribbon and a bow. After taking so much care with wrapping them earlier, there's no surprise that Kyle's determined that his handiwork stays in one piece on the transporter's bed. It just needs to go half an inch, that's about it. It's not a lot. Go on, John. Good. They've done it. All locked and loaded. There's now just the final bit of paperwork to fill in. When you strap it down, can you keep your curtain open? Yeah, I've got to take, take the photos as well, and we've still got to put documents and T1s on it. He basically got to wait now for a customs note. So when we get that customs note, we'll put the DG paperwork on it, the flammable sticker that's already gone on it, and then basically once we've taken the photographs, get the escort to come and get it, and he's out here. Now, in stark contrast to the speed in which the Airbus A319 was stripped by our high-vis heroes, a little calm and patience is required. The I's need to be dotted and the T's crossed. And with that, the transporter, laden with its precious cargo, can hit the road. For these old engines, a new life awaits up in the air. <laughs>